Okay, hi folks, Carol Ann here from Sassy Town S Living, and today we're super excited, at least I am, to be able to speak with Dr. Bick Wank. Wank. Sorry about that, Wank. I want to keep saying Wank, but it's Wank, uh, right? That's the closest, yes. <laughs> okay. He is a psychiatrist and an author, and he's one of the founders of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. Dr. Bick Wank is a board-certified doctor in psychiatry and an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at Albany Medical College in Albany, New York. In 1986, he founded Bick Wank, MD and Associates, which is a highly regarded private medical health group practice. And his successful therapy treatment program is based on the philosophy that people have inherent self-healing and growth processes that can change negative distorted perceptions with ones that are positive and healthy. And today we're talking with Dr. Wank about his new book, Mind Easing, the Three-Layered Healing Plan for Anxiety and Depression, which was an excellent read. I highly recommend it. And this is a self-help book for general readers as well as professionals. And it details in great depth his three-layered healing plan for anxiety and depression. So thank you so much again, doctor, for being here. Um, I greatly appreciate it. So thank you get, so much for having me. Thank you. To get things started, um, as I said, I read your book and I, I absolutely loved it. It was so full of so much different information, but it came together in a very holistic approach. And um, I want, if you, if you don't mind, to let our listeners know a little bit more about your background, where you grew up, your experiences, your childhood that molded you into who you are today, and why healing and relieving suffering is so important to you. Certainly. Thank you. Well, I was categorized Appalachian and given minority status in college. This dates me because at the time, uh, minorities included Appalachians. They don't now because of the internet and uh, uh, other cable TV and so forth. So at the time, uh, I was apparently appropriately uh, classified uh, minority Appalachian. Uh, consequently, I have a rather practical approach to things, and I think that's reflected in mind easing. Uh, my thinking is, Let's do whatever works. So mind easing is uh, an outgrowth of what I find has been helpful uh, to the folks I've worked with. It's also been helpful to me. I would say I've probably tried just about everything I've written about in mind easing with the exception of medication. So my experience, you ask, uh, I had a great deal of adversity uh, growing up, uh, surrounded by addiction, a great deal of physical trauma, um, I learned how to fight. Uh, street fighting became uh, an adventure sport for me. Unfortunately, I can't recommend it, uh, but uh, it certainly uh, led me to pursue ways in which I might be able to find some healing for myself. Uh, that is the biggest motivator that drove me into psychiatry, looking for some help for myself. Along the way, uh, you name it, I've tried it psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, counseling, uh, sweat lodges, uh, group therapy, uh, codependency recovery, any self-help group that would have me, uh, you name it, seems like I've just about done it. Uh, so a lot of these uh, approaches, uh, I've uh, personally driven them around myself and found uh, the ones that I've written about to be uh, quite helpful for myself and for the folks who come to see me. Could you talk a little bit about your experience in Peru with the shamans? I found that to be really intriguing. Uh, during medical school, uh, although I felt it was a wonderful education, I felt like medicine was missing the mark. Uh, there was very little discussion about healing. It was all about treatment and uh, dealing with symptoms. So I felt frustrated by the lack of emphasis on healing, and I, I uh, decided to to leave medicine for a year. Uh, the other reason I was in an inner city medical school and there was a great deal of racism, uh, which I found very offensive. 
So I hit the road, lived out of a van for a year, uh, intended to drive to Peru, ended up flying much easier, uh, stayed for about three months in Peru. Uh, and during that time, climbed mountains, uh, did some uh, very serious hiking as well. Uh, I was intensely involved in adventure sports at the time. And I most of all wanted to spend time with uh, local indigenous people. I'd grown up uh, in the country uh, with country people, hill people, uh, also had been indoctrinated in uh, Native American culture by my grandmother and my father, uh, spent time in reservations uh, as a young man uh, and uh, adolescent. Uh, so I was attracted to people who were close to nature. So, uh, I figured they might be able to have some answers for me. I'd spent some time with medicine men on reservations uh, Native American reservations and sought that out while I was in Peru. Uh, so in the, in the, after doing some mountaineering, I went into the, as they call it there, the forest, the jungle we call it, uh, and uh, hired a guy to take me, I decided upriver rather than downriver after looking at his dugout canoe uh, and uh, stumbled, I won't go into the detail, but stumbled into a uh, situation which I was quite um, rather intensively tested uh, and then later accepted uh, into the, the clan, which was part of a larger tribe. Uh, and there I uh, got connected with a shaman. And uh, at that time, I was still affected by medicine uh, mm -hmm. and turned off to Western medicine. And I really wanted to study his approach. Uh, shamanic healing. Uh, he would self-induce a trance, travel to other realms, bring back healing energy to his patients uh, who did very well, with the exception of children who had who were infested by parasitic worms. Now it turns out I had in my bag a bunch of anti-helminthics, uh, that's uh, antibiotics for parasitic worms. I told him about it, fearing that he would be offended but he was overjoyed. He said, that medicine is more powerful than the medicine that I have in order to help these children, many of whom had already died from parasitic infections. So his incorporation of my Western medicine uh, filled the, was the missing link for me. Mm. It, put it helped me put it together. I said, well, there's gotta be a way to combine uh, some uh, holistic approach with wellness uh, treatments other than medicinal treatments and when needed medicine as well. So I brought that knowledge back with me. I would say I snuck it back in my bag of tools uh, to apply during residency. I studied psychiatry and at uh, Syracuse, uh, where Syracuse, New York, uh, where Thomas Sass was. He wrote The Myth of Mental Illness, thinking if they could accept an anti-psychiatrist, uh, surely they could accept a psychiatrist in training who really wished to help people, but do it in perhaps not an entirely conventional approach. And that's why you still prescribe medication for some folks that need it, but your main approach is really a holistic approach. I mean, that seems to be you know, your preferred approach, am I right? That's right. I like to spend time with people. I like to talk to people. Uh, I like to get to know people. I like to understand better what's going on. Uh, and I find that uh, enhancing the healing process with uh, wellness approaches, therapy approaches, and medicine when needed uh, works quite well. I'm not opposed to medicine. I don't want anybody to get me wrong about that. I think medicine is very powerful. I've seen it save lives and lifestyles. I've seen it be able to uh, increase concentration, focus. People can return to uh, working and loving, and they can return to being able to make good use of therapy and wellness approaches. Right. In your book, you talk about this three-layered healing plan, which seems to be um, you know, the basis of, of what your, your book is about. Could you just explain some of the process involved in how 
like a listener might be able to understand what it is and how they can start to maybe create one for themselves? Absolutely. So the, the three layer healing plan is simply an outgrowth of what I do in my own work. Uh, layer one, uh, by the way, this is all based upon the premise that if we were to assist the natural healing process, that would result in safer and more effective outcomes. It seems backward to me to rush into treating symptoms. Rather, I would say, let's find out what's wrong and assist the natural process of healing. So in order to assist the natural process of healing, I, I've uh, broken it down into, into three categories, three layers, and they can be uh, added sequentially as needed, if needed. Layer one enhancement of healing is something that I recommend everyone do. Enhancement of healing is uh, making use of wellness methods uh, such as uh, attitude adjustment, uh, improving one's attitude toward oneself, uh, behavioral change uh, that involves uh, several uh, behavior approaches that I'll talk about later, uh, and compassionate love, the importance of uh, bringing uh, kind, loving, and compassionate people or uh, other species into your world. Uh, you'll find in mind easing an example of that with Ginger's, uh, sorry, the main character, Lisa's dog, Ginger. So if enhancing healing with wellness approaches is not enough, then I recommend adding moving to layer two, which is guidance of healing. Healing can be guided with psychotherapy, uh, counseling, uh, spiritual uh, healing processes, and also body and energy work like massage therapy, acupuncture. Uh, so layer two, the way of guiding therapy would be done by a professional, a counselor, a therapist, uh, um, a, a life uh, coach, uh, and others, uh, uh, therapy, uh, massage therapists, acupuncturists, uh, spiritual healers. Uh, when layer two, layer two often is enough to take care of the problem, anxiety or depression. If that's not enough, if people are so distracted uh, and so disabled by severe sadness or extreme anxiety, panic attacks, uh, despair, so they can't concentrate, focus, make use of layer two, then medicine is sometimes helpful. That's layer three, restoration of the healing process by using medicine to reduce the degree of suffering enough to make use of the first two layers. Um, as far as the first layer goes, how, how does one get that jump start to say, okay, I'm tired of suffering, whatever the condition is. You know, I read your book and, and I want to do this so badly, but I, I can't, I don't know where to begin. I don't know how to get started. Because I think a lot of folks go right into like seeing a psychiatrist or getting psychotherapy or is or are they doing layer one and they don't even realize they're doing that? I would say most people are already doing layer one if they're paying attention to their diet and exercising. Uh, there's more to it than that, but those are uh, two of the most important basics. Uh, so getting started with some relief from suffering, sometimes people would be inclined to go to a therapist. I think that's fine, that's great, uh, being able to get some guidance and perhaps some reinforcement for in addition to exploring what the causes might be of suffering or uh, what the programming might be from adversity earlier on in life in order to resolve it, uh, perhaps a therapist may be helpful in guiding the person to uh, make use of uh, some enhancements of healing. But if someone is starting from scratch and not seeing a therapist or a prescriber, mm. uh, then I would say um, it may be indeed helpful to take a look at mind easing. Um, and in the absence of that, do what you can to bring in some positive attitudes. Uh, the ones that I list in mind easing are uh, self-acceptance, perseverance, mm -hmm. and gratitude. Self-acceptance is a matter of 
having curiosity about yourself, not judging yourself. The ways in which you go about things, the which, way in which any of us go about things, has been determined by a great deal of experiences throughout our lives. So ways of coping that were important early on sometimes are not as important in adulthood, but they linger, they continue. They were there for good reason. In many cases, they save people's lives. So I think taking a look at the way that people uh, view the world and view relationships and respond to relationships uh, is important to maintain some uh, objectivity, uh, as I say, curiosity. Uh, kill your shame with curiosity about yourself. Uh, the second, perseverance. Uh, don't give up. No. Never give up. Keep looking. If one way doesn't work, try another way. Uh, there's no, uh, because of the number of variables involved in anxiety and depression, there are so many ways uh, uh, people have of understanding it and approaching how to relieve it. Uh, there are many ways to go about it. So if one way doesn't work, try another one. Gratitude. Gratitude, I think, is important. It's especially important when you feel you don't have enough. Exercising gratitude can help, uh, can help your attitude. So that's uh, the attitude part. The behavior part, this is the part where it does require effort mm -hmm. and commitment. It's necessary to take it very seriously uh, because it can make a huge difference to be able to change behaviors in healthy ways. I often write on actually a prescription pad. It's my favorite prescription to write. And it goes like this. M-E-D-S, MEDS, stands for Mindfulness, Exercise, Diet, and Stress Management. And I review those things with people. I say, for mindfulness, you don't have to meditate, although it can be extraordinarily helpful. Uh, and there's some good science to back that up. Mm -hmm. But simply being in the moment, paying attention to where you are and what you're doing, Right now, for example, I'm having a lovely conversation with Carol Ann uh, coming into it. I was a bit nervous, never having used Skype before. Carol Ann has been extraordinarily helpful to me. And before I started speaking with you, I did something I call a 60-second mindfulness check-in. Take a deep breath and then breathe normally and slowly and pay attention to what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're smelling, what you're feeling, and then tune into how your emotional state is. Whatever your emotional state is, observe that, non-judgmentally, don't question it, and don't think that it's wrong, just accept whatever feeling you're having in the moment. Take another deep breath, and return gently to your busy life. That can be very helpful for centering. I have to say, I love that. That is such an excellent tip. Thank you, thank you. I do, I just love that. I, I think after I read, I read that, I practiced it so many times because none of us take that moment to like be in the moment and enjoy what we're doing in the moment and you know have that self-awareness. So just that little exercise is brilliant. Brilliant. Now, in your book, you, you make a point of clarifying that like anxiety and depression in general is caused by three factors. So there's, you classify unreasonable stress, childhood, adversity, trauma, and genetics, right? And you right. say that these, these causes can mimic like addiction and medical problems. And then you talk about the hardware and the software. Can you just go into a little bit about that so our listeners can understand like, and give them a, like some type of perception as to what could be causing their anxiety and depression? Sure. This is a question I ask myself every time I meet with someone. I say, what is or are the sources of this person's distress? I'm much less interested in symptoms and more interested in causes. By the way, the way mind e one of the ways mind easing is different from a standard medical approach 
ordinarily in medical approaches, uh, doctors in particular mm -hmm. are interested in knowing what symptoms someone is having. Right. So create a list of symptoms. From that list of symptoms comes a diagnosis, and from that diagnosis comes a treatment, usually a prescribed medication. I think that's backwards. I think symptoms are important to know about, but what's more important is knowing what has caused those symptoms. So the three things that I think are the causes of anxiety and depression are uh, current stressors, mm -hmm. past adversity, which may be traumatic, and third, genetics. The two conditions that can mimic those three essential causes are medical conditions and addictions. Medical conditions uh, such as hypothyroidism. Low thyroid can look like depression. Mm -hmm. People can be slowed down and feeling uh, down emotionally. Uh, and in order to decide whether, in fact, there is an essential cause of depression, it's necessary to treat the hypothyroidism, get that taken care of before you decide, okay, uh, there appears to be, in addition to hypothyroidism, some other cause of depression, maybe something going on currently. Someone died, there was a tough childhood, maybe there's a genetic or a bloodline of depression. But take care of the medical, uh, possible medical causes first. Addiction, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, sex, gambling, internet, all these things. Anything, right? Anything, any, all these things, anything taken to excess uh, can cause anxiety or depression. So I say, give me at least two weeks without uh, the addictive chemical or behavior, and then let's take a look. That can be a tough two weeks, especially if someone's going through a serious uh, detox from alcohol. It can be dangerous. It should be medically supervised if someone's drinking a lot. They could have a seizure in, in the absence of anything. Um, but However it's done, I say spend at least two weeks without the substance or the behavior and then take another look. Is, that, is the degree of anxiety and depression still there? <clears throat> if so, maybe it's one of the three uh, essential causes of anxiety and depression, which are, again, current stressors, past <laughs> adversity, which could include trauma, or number three, genetics. And that is according to bloodline. If in your blood family there was a significant degree of anxiety or significant degree of depression, then perhaps that's a partial explanation for the anxiety and depression you may be experiencing yourself. So in the case that it's genetic, um, say, like in my case, um, my mother had anxiety, and then when I was 11, I had my first panic attack, and there was nothing really other than pointing to the fact that it was genetic, for me at least, anyway. So what would what would you do in that case? Would you recommend, like, this three-layered approach, or would you directly go to medication to help this person? Like, isn't it hard to discern how to treat someone with medicine or without medicine? I mean, that must be a really difficult decision to have to make. It's pretty simple in my mind. Of course, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> but my, my way of thinking about it is uh, if someone is suffering so much that they can't concentrate, they can't manage their lives, they can't even talk about what's wrong, uh, then medication may be helpful, to re again, to reduce the symptoms enough so they'd be able to talk about what their problems are, what the issues are and be able to engage in some wellness activities like exercise, uh, healthy diet, stress management. Uh, so sometimes uh, it is helpful to go to medicine uh, relatively early in the process. But the way to gauge that is, according by, is really according to the degree of suffering. If the suffering is so severe that the person really can't function, can't do anything else to help themselves, then medicine may be, may be useful. But with regard to anxiety, the little bit you shared with me about yourself, 
I think you are the poster child for successful recovery from anxiety. Oh, thank you. Been very, uh, very diligent. Uh, you've applied yourself very effectively and you've been very successful. Uh, and managing to do that uh, with, I think you said, biofeedback and maybe yeah. some other approaches. Fantastic. So I don't think it's always necessary to jump right to medicine. If someone has a strong family history, uh, bloodline history, uh, it, can very, it can be very helpful, but it can also be somewhat confounding. So if there is a significant amount of anxiety or depression in the family, that of course can affect how people are raised. If your parents were troubled by severe anxiety or depression, they may have been necessarily and unfortunately neglectful uh, right. or harsh or perhaps even abusive at times. So it can be difficult sometimes to separate uh, childhood adversity from uh, genetics. On the other hand, I've known people who have tried everything. They've tried uh, exercise, diet, mindfulness, meds, M-E-D-S, mindfulness, exercise, diet, stress management, psychotherapy, massage therapy, acupuncture, spiritual healing, you, you name it, they've tried everything. Mm -hmm. Things haven't gotten better and they've blamed themselves for it. Uh, sometimes uh, genetics is the explanation. Sometimes it's the culprit. I've actually had uh, a few people come to see me uh, for whom uh, it was very clearly a genetic, biological, uh, I would say brain rather than mind problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately, and this, this is hit or miss, but fortunately for them, we were able to hit upon the proper cocktail of medicine uh, that they experience substantial relief. Uh, and once they experience less in the way of symptoms and were not suffering much at all in the way of side effects, then we started talking about their lives. In a couple of cases, I found out there was really not a problem. They didn't have unusual stress in their lives. They had lovely childhoods, uh, no childhood adversity. Uh, and interestingly, there wasn't much to talk about. Uh, that's unusual to All have right. such a pure case of, uh, I would call it almost more of a neurological depression rather than a psychological depression. Right. I just want folks out there listening to know that there's hope, um, too, that, that, because I, I know some folks that suffer from you know, really debilitating anxiety and they feel often hopeless. And, um, you know, I, I, I want them to know that, that's why I, I loved your book, because I think at the end you see that there's hope and that there is a plan towards health and there is some work involved. You know, you do have to be an active participant in your healing. Um, I think a lot of people just want to be lazy about it, too, and just take medication and not try to do the work to get better. So it's, it's really nice to know that... Um, you know, there's a holistic way to approach anxiety and depression, too. Thank you. Yes, it does take some effort. Um, I'm a lifeguard. My first job, actually, and my first career, I should say, was lifeguarding. Uh, of course, I'm a water nut. I just celebrated 50 years of diving. Oh, uh, wonderful. Swam for Penn State years ago. Uh, and uh, so I relate to the lifeguard concept. I'm still a lifeguard. So what we do in um, mental health and addiction work, in addition to helping people relieve suffering, is we're lifeguards. Now the problem, uh, the problem with suicide, it's, as you know, uh, a very leading uh, factor in death uh, today, 10th yes. uh, leading, 10th uh, uh, most uh, common cause of, of death, in fact, currently. Um, and the problem with suicide uh, is it can happen very abruptly and impulsively. Uh, it, so much so, I've taken to calling them suicide attacks, like heart attacks. Wow. Usually people only have a few minutes to reach out for help when they're feeling so desperate they're uh, on the verge of uh, killing themselves. Uh, so 
in mind easing, I address the issue of, uh, I see the, um, the driving force behind a lot of suicide is a delusion. It doesn't mean that people are psychotic or crazy, but it is a delusion. It's, it's a fixed, it's a belief that's not true. And the belief is, it's a delusion of permanent, permanent misery. Mm. When, and unfortunately we humans, when we feel miserable, when we feel awful, severe suffering, we have the mistaken belief that it's going to last forever. I wish we had that about joy. If only we had, we felt joyful and we thought, oh good, I'm going to be joyful for the rest of my life. Not true. Only happens with suffering, with feeling misery. There's a delusion that it won't go away. So I, I tell people that's wrong. It does go away. One of two things happen. One is things get better or you find a way of getting used to things being so lousy mm. and then they don't seem so lousy. So I say to people, don't do anything to harm yourself. Call somebody. Right. If you feel like call somebody right then. There is an 800 number, 1-800-SUICIDE. And I recommend that people make use of that. There are wonderful counselors, therapists at the other end of the line, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there are probably hotlines available in each of the communities of your readership or viewership. Uh, and uh, usually, it, I, I, in most cases, the local communities have a hotline yes. as well. Uh, and what I like to do is uh, write on a card uh, for someone, and so I, I usually do two cards, one for their wallet, one for their mirror, uh -huh. a safety card. Here are a couple of phone numbers you can call if things are really bad. And please tell me who you can call, who in your life can you call when things are really bad and you're feeling absolutely hopeless. So I write those names and the phone numbers, uh, and I also uh, suggest, if all else fails, call 911. Right. Somebody come over, give you a ride to emergency department to have an evaluation. Um, do you think that social media, well, obviously it is, is playing a, a big part in the youth of today wanting to to commit suicide so frequently? Like the the statistics have been so high every year, increasing and increasing in youth suicide. So do you think that like social media is playing a big part in this? And if so, why? Like, why do you think this is happening? You said it, people get very wrapped up in this stuff. Uh, they take it too seriously. Uh, so it is a su substantial problem. Uh, and I'm uh, hoping to include a chapter about it in the next book, which is going yes. to be about urges uh, I'm thinking the IT itch or something like that. Uh, it's, it's outrageous. Uh, so, you know, here I am releasing a book and hoping that people will get benefit from it and, in fact, go out and get it. So I've been encouraged by my publisher and others to engage in social media. Right. Uh, and I'm not from that era. Growing up, we had no Internet and no, we had no TV. We had TVs, but they didn't work. There was no reception. <laughs> right. So um, I started tweeting and linking and facing and doing all this stuff that people are supposed to do, although I didn't catch on to Instagram yet. And I found that uh, in my case, I was having palpitations and irregular heartbeats, checking my Twitter feed. No thinking, way. Oh my God, my my followers have dropped off. This is horrible. This is this is potentially disastrous. So ah. I got very caught up in this stuff, mm. and I said, "Wait a minute! I'm having palpitations and skipped heartbeats over my Twitter feed. That's nuts." So I took a time out. I did a 60 second mindfulness uh, check in, uh, which did nothing. By the way, it had no effect. I couldn't concentrate. I was too wrapped up in Twitter to even be able to pay attention to how I was breathing. So I thought, okay, that's it for me. I'm gonna get out of Twitter. So I found out how to delete my Twitter account just as I was no about way. to 
Yep, yep. <laughs> Just as I was about to push the delete button, a friend in South Africa tweeted me that she had just received my book and she loves it. And she just sent out a tweet to her thousand plus followers. Uh, and, the, and the next tweet I saw from her was in two hours, 91 people had, had already viewed this tweet and were and liking it and interested in uh, buying the book. So I said, okay, maybe I should keep my Twitter feed. <laughs> But I guess I'd better change my attitude. So there are ways to manage this. I put it under the, the category of stress management. That's the S in meds, M-E-D-S, mindfulness, exercise, diet, stress management. So in order to manage Twitter stress or Facebook stress or Instagram stress, um, by the way, uh, it's extraordinary the data and i don't know I, I can't cite specifics but i've been aware of some of the data regarding the use of uh social media by young people and you're referring to this uh they they're tormented by it uh, many of them uh so uh i certainly uh, recommend using whatever methods of stress management one could so i say RIP your stress, R-I-P, rest in peace your stress. <laughs> Actually, the R-I-P stands for, uh, for this. Reduce, improve, and pace. The way to reduce your stress is disengage from drama, social drama. People talking about each other, you see that a lot on uh, social media. Uh, kids are just waiting to find out Am I liked enough? Is somebody saying something negative about me? I say turn away from the negativity. Just remove connections that are toxic. That's R, I, improve, uh, find connections in your life that are fulfilling and meaningful. Activities, people, dogs, whatever it may be. Engage in social media in a way that's constructive, not destructive. Right. And P, pace. Pace means dial down your inner tension. Because when I became so caught up in my Twitter feed, what I realized was nobody's telling me to do this. This is me. I'm doing this to myself. So if I can just dial that down and have it be less important, uh, decompress that way, that's one other way to deal with yeah, social that's media. so true, because basically nobody really cares about anybody else on social media except for themselves. Well so, said. So, it, it's so true. So we're making these narratives up in our own mind about our self-perception. And, you know, pacing yourself is really great recommendation because, and doing that, I know you said it didn't work for you, but just sitting back and doing that 60-second check you know, will allow you to say, hey, these people really only care about themselves. So I'm going to do this and only care about me. And you, it was great that you kept your Twitter account because, you know, I mean, I think you did think about it and realize, hey, this is going to benefit me. You know, sometimes it has to be about you. You know what I mean? Right, so even, right. even though that, say, what would have happened if that woman didn't tweet you probably would have deleted your account, right? It's a great way for me to stay in touch with my friend in South Africa. Exactly. And it's going to be a, way, a great way to get the word out about sassy townhouse living. <laughs> <laughs> See, you have to use, like, you know, all, all social media smartly. Because not only kids are getting hurt by this, but adults are, too. I mean, I can tell you some stories that affected adults. Sure. Um, so it's, it's, yes, it's tragic when it happens to children, especially because they don't have the tools that adults have to deal with these problems like we do. But, um, you know, they, they suffer from anxiety and depression even worse than adults do. Yes, yeah, statistically, that's true. Two things I, I often will say to people, including myself, about this. Uh, one, it's not life-threatening. Right. It need to be life-threatening. 
whatever you're doing with social media or otherwise does not need to be life-threatening. It's not life-threatening. Uh, and number two, turn away from it. That's what I had to do with Twitter. I just had to turn away from it. And then I could do my 60-second mindfulness check-in. Right, right. right. Now, in your book, you used Lisa um, as like your case study. And I'm assuming this is based on a, a real person, not not her name. I'm sure you changed her name. But I love the way that you, you did it. It's actually you, not a real person. It's not a real person. Oh, no, no. Oh, you see, a lot of times doctors do that. They'll take one of their clients and kind of run with it. I don't like that. Doing anecdotes are interesting. Uh, however... I never want to reveal anybody's identity, uh, even in an anecdote without names attached. Uh, so Lisa and her friends are actually a work of fiction. So there's uh, ah. a novella embedded in mind easing. Uh, I fell in love with Lisa and her friends, uh, and she took on uh, a personality of her own. Uh, a life of her own. I'm sure she's an amalgam of myself, my wife, my friends, my children, uh, my patients, everybody mixed together, my life experiences particularly, I would suppose, especially when Lisa's having a problem with surfing. <laughs> so all these uh, characters uh, I invented uh, from imagination and developed in order to hopefully engage the reader and show how easy it is to construct a three-layered healing plan. And it worked brilliantly because as you're reading, um, you, like you'll give a little, you know, example of what she's suffering through, what she's feeling, and then your, you know, your next chapter goes into great depth about what a person can do about that, like the approach that they can take, whether it's exercise, diet, you know, just the whole gamut. So I really liked your approach in doing that. It Thanks. really like brought me out of the book and then back into the book. So it was great. Um, anything else that you can share about your book with our listeners that you feel is um, of utmost important in helping them and to be able to help them find healing? Well, I can tell you something that a lot of people have really taken interest in. Uh, pro professional people as well as lay people, and that's the concept of soft versus hard anxiety and depression. So, again, this is something I simply do myself when I meet with people. I think to myself, is this person suffering with soft anxiety or depression, or is this hard anxiety or depression? So it goes like this. Soft anxiety or depression is, think of software. It's a program problem. It's due to current stressors or it's due to past adversity. When someone is raised um, in a circumstance, let's say, for example, uh, a harsh punitive parent, uh, that can often uh, uh, cause the person to have a, a low self-esteem, uh, to imagine the worst, uh, to be attracted to people who might be mean to them, uh, there can be an expectation that the world is a, uh, a harsh and a dangerous place uh, and people can be uh, subconsciously attracted to the familiar, actually attracted to people who are not kind. Mm. So um, that's a, an example of uh, programming mm -hmm. uh, that can be reversed by uh, using psychotherapy. People become aware, oh yeah, the reason that I have such a low uh, uh, opinion of myself is because I was taught that as a child. Maybe that doesn't have to be there. Uh, and could it be that the series of relationships that I've stumbled through in my life uh, have a familiar pattern? Uh, maybe it's based on something from earlier in my life. Uh, by looking at that and becoming aware of it and uh, maybe being attracted to um, people who you might otherwise think are a bit boring Mm -hmm. uh, or unfamiliar may actually be healthy. Uh, so that's uh, an example of software problems. Uh, and they can usually be uh, helped with layer one, enhancement of healing with healthy behaviors and wellness, and layer two, therapy, various kinds of therapy. Uh, hard uh, anxiety and depression 
are, can be due to one of two things. Uh, number one, genetic. As I said earlier, sometimes I meet people for whom it's clearly a neurological depression. Not a lot to explain it uh, based on past adversity. That's a clear example of a genetic problem. Mm -hmm. uh, another form of uh, hard anxiety or depression could be severe uh, protracted adversity or trauma early on. Uh, I've become convinced over the years that sometimes people can only go so far in working through severe trauma or persistent adversity from earlier in life. Sometimes it becomes physiologically fixed. It just becomes stuck uh, mm. neurologically uh, and does not budge easily with psychotherapy or other kinds of therapies. Uh, and that's where uh, medicine can sometimes be useful and sometimes even necessary. So the hard and soft uh, uh, dichotomy, the way of thinking about problems as being either uh, solvable uh, through uh, layer one and layer two enhancement and, and guidance of healing or need to be uh, helped with layer three medicine is a way for me to be able to think about things this way. Uh, naturally, someone can have both soft and hard, which is not unusual. There may be some genetic depression, and it could be uh, that there was some adversity, as I alluded to earlier. Early on, uh, there may have been some neglect or harshness because of apparent suffering. Uh, so it can be both. And sometimes, uh, as you might imagine, uh, in this case, Lisa uh, benefited from all three layers. Right. She had uh, genetic uh, depression uh, on her mother's side, and she had childhood adversity. Her father was often coming home drunk and uh, uh, hurt her as she was growing up. So she had uh, both soft and hard uh, types of uh, anxiety and depression, which made it difficult uh, to sort out in her mind uh, <coughs> and made it difficult for her to find love in her life. I'm not going to spoil that, one, but as you might imagine, there is a good outcome. Why is it that you think that um, medical science today doesn't look at um, the causality of things like anxiety and depression, and they're just aimed at the treatment of 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 the side of, of the symptoms of the disease? The minute you walk into a doctor's office and you say, "Feeling this way, that way." and they know that it's either anxiety or depression, the first thing they want to do is write you a prescription. Do you think that will change over time? Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> uh -huh. Do you think that will change um, over time? Do you see it evolving? And why do you think that's the case? Sure, thanks. Oh, your dog, by the way, is probably reminding you that there are other sources of compassionate love in, in addition <laughs> to humans. Yes. <laughs> So I, I think that researchers, academicians, are interested in knowing why uh, people suffer anxiety and depression. A lot of the research uh, that's happening is more neurological and chemically based. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's a lot of wonderful information that comes of that. Uh, however, in practical terms, uh, this is how it goes in most cases. Uh, most prescribers have 15 minutes maximum, more like 10 with each patient. So when someone steps into the room uh, of a well-intentioned but time-starved prescriber, and when the person stepping into the room looks upset, that prescriber might think, wow, this person looks really upset. I wonder what I could prescribe to help her feel better. Yes. When the person walks into the office of someone who has more time, takes more time, and look if that person walking into the office looks upset, uh, then the clinician sitting in the office might be more inclined to think, wow, this person looks like she's really suffering. I wonder what's wrong, mm. and go from there. That's such an excellent point. So ba basically, it's, it's, it's not so much that they don't know that medical science doesn't know that that's the best way to treat a person, but because of things like insurance and, you know, other complex things that go on in the, our healthcare system, 
they basically don't have the choice. Well, thank God for folks like you that that um, do take the time and and are willing and have led a life that has driven them to this research and unearthing such amazing information. So we're blessed to have folks like you on the planet. Thank you very much. My hope is that this will get the attention of some prescribers. Um, but frankly, I think that the people that we're going to need to rely on more than the prescribers are the therapists, the mm -hmm. layer two, the people who guide healing, psychotherapists, counselors, other kinds of therapists have the time to consider these questions. They also have the time to help their clients think about what questions to ask the prescribers. I'm not counting on any immediate change for the prescribers. Mm. I think the system is very self-reinforcing -re and not likely to be altered easily. Uh, but if we can spend more time with, if I can give more attention to the layer two uh, counselors, therapists, and suggest some of these approaches that they could share with their clients, then that might help people when they step into their prescriber's office with only 10 minutes to spare. Such great points. So your book is available um, since March, and of course they can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your website, any place else? Um, actually, they would be directed probably to Amazon through my website, thank you. Um, and that is www.bickwankmd.com. Uh, but it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Target, um, also independent bookstores, uh, my favorite. And uh, it's now available on audible.com as an audiobook. Wonderful, wonderful. A lot of folks love the audiobook as they're driving to work. So, right. and um, I. I can't express enough how important I think it is for folks who are suffering from either mild anxiety or depression to extreme to read your book. Um, it's really, I think, life changing and can be leading you to the path of, of you know, wellness. And um, I, I will definitely spread the word for you. I have such admiration for everything that you've taken the time to do for us and um i thank you so much for speaking with us today thank you so much carol ann i very much appreciate it thank you doctor <laughs>